This is exactly right. Is that from a lawn? It does not look like what they stick out, like, don't walk over here on this lawn. We just planted <laughs> tulips. <laughs> Holy shit, you Hi, guys. guys! Wow. Truly, wow. Dude. Next level. Yeah. Next level, clapping. Yeah. <laughs> Eardrums. Who needs them? Boom. That's the goal, right? Blow out all eardrums. <laughs> Jesus. First of all, are we in space? That's my first question. Yeah. Is this normally a basketball arena? Is this, <laughs> they put quite, chairs in? It's quite large. Yeah. How well, are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have anything prepared. We didn't know you guys... <laughs> We didn't think it was going to be this intense between us. Yeah. We just thought, we thought it was cash. <laughs> <laughs> My boots, thank you. Oh, yeah. Get into it. Why, why not get right into it then if she wants you to? <laughs> Here was the risk. Here was the risk. When we went and did the Grand Old Opry two weekends ago, right beforehand, I was reading some emails in our, in our account, and one of them was like, here's my hometown. By the way, when you go to Nashville, don't wear a dress and cowboy boots because we make fun of all the tourists and bachelorette parties who do that. <laughs> so I was like, great, and I wore heels. But then I was like, well, what if Oklahoma City is okay with it? And I really want to wear them. Yeah, thank you. They don't have rules here. Yeah. They're not trying to get up in our business about don't do this and we'll laugh at you if that. They're just like, come and listen to us scream, please. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, in L.A. we make fun of this too, so I don't know what I was thinking. I feel like these days everybody's a target, and they should be. <laughs> Buck up. That's right. <laughs> Deal with it. That's a, I love that outfit, though. It's Thank really you. good. This was made by a murderino for specifically us, Sarah Duke from Toronto. When we were there, she gave us dresses. Georgia tried to remind me of this moment, and I was just like, give me something else. I was like, I don't key know. boxes. She's like, she gave us dresses in line. I'm like, no, not, <laughs> nothing's coming back. Nothing Ma at all. Maybe you didn't like yours. No. Ooh, don't but say look. that. Pockets. Yeah. Pockets. Two pockets? Two what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And she somehow was able to get this fucking A cup to get cleavage of yes. all things. I've never, this is like, everyone look. Yeah. They Boobs. want to. It's great. They're great. It feels like, I feel like a grown up. Like I, like, you know, when you try in your mom's shoes and I tried on my mom's boobs and walked around. <laughs> Janet, what's up, Janet? <laughs> Does Janet have tiny boobs? Janet uh, has Stephen store bought. Mark this. Stephen marked this already. Janet has store bought boobs. Oklahoma City, that is a secret for you <laughs> to keep in this room. That is, that goes straight into the vault. <laughs> I don't know if she cares. I think she's proud of it. Is she? <laughs> yeah, look, she fucking breastfed three. Why am I telling everyone this? Yeah, I am. Um, but my dad recently, we were hanging out, and he he was Marty. Marty. I've had a lot of coffee, and I'm just dominating. Go this for conversation. it. No, I, w I hope you do. <laughs> he said to me, uh, "You know, when I'm in the audience and you start talking bad about your mom, um, I just want you to know I don't care." <laughs> <laughs> Because he's just, it's fine. Because I'm always like, I'm sorry, Dad. He's like, I don't care. 
Marty. Guess a lot of shit went down between them. Guess so. I mean, look, what is it? Listen. Anne Lamott says, listen, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry to interrupt the now call and response show that we're doing <laughs> everywhere we go. Every, everybody does it. Um, I was just going to say Anne Lamott, the great writer, has an amazing quote, right, uh, where she talked because people, she teaches writing classes and people want to do autobiographical stuff, but then they're like, I feel bad writing about my family and the stuff that they did, and she says, well, if they didn't want to get written about, they shouldn't have acted like that, <laughs> 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 which is the best. That's right. So you get to say what you want. Yeah. May 28th, Stay Sexy and Don't Get Murdered, the book. We did that. <laughs> Talk about saying what we want and then only realizing afterwards that a whole bunch of people are going yep. to read it. <laughs> That's the weird thing about writing a book. It's for others. Right. It's odd. It's very odd. Too much lotion? I'm sweating. No, oh. it's sweat. This is a dress by Simply B. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> but I Those almost... Are new. What? I almost don't want to play along because they, it does not have pockets. Oh. Um, I know. I'm sorry. It's store-bought. Um, <laughs> Those are little kitten heels. I love them. These we got, we got these for free oh, from shit. some clothing place at some point. I don't remember that. And I remember when I got them, I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look like a goat if I wear those. But <laughs> I feel like it's spring and the goat look suits me. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I like it. I think it's good. Well, what a goat suit. <laughs> these, are, these are my hooves. Do you, do you want to live deliciously? Anybody? Can we get some grass out here for Karen? <laughs> um, oh, no, I wanted to apologize. Oh. When we pulled into the theater tonight, we got out of the car, and um, some best friends of ours pulled up in their <laughs> car and then just screamed at the top of their <laughs> lungs at us. And I turned and looked. I don't know what you did because you are on the other side of the car. Uh -huh. I just stared at them <laughs> because the screaming was so intense. I thought they were looking for the emergency room <laughs> or they were being chased. So I was just kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. And then they just were like this at us. But and I was like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> what if they were doing that and the other girl that they were yelling to where's the emergency room was going, hi, that was me. Hi. <laughs> but they ended up, they were just come in. come in, but they were like, we need to know who the fuck are you? We're bleeding. So much blood <laughs> in this car. Okay. Nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, sorry, gals. I'll scream back at you next time. <laughs> louder. Yeah. And longer. Yeah. It's just sometimes screaming like at six o'clock is jarring. In the afternoon or in the morning? <laughs> when it's still light outside and someone screams at you from a car, it's scary. Uh-huh. That's fair. Thank you. <laughs> I know they meant well. I just feel like I know my face can get pretty serious and scary sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't blow dried my hair yet, so I'm sure there was a real... <laughs> you look like one of the witches from Macbeth turned around and stared at him. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. I didn't mean it. <laughs> oh, speaking of, this is my favorite murder. This is my podcast. favorite murder. Thanks. This is... Karen Kilgara. This is Georgia Hardstark. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephen is home. That's um, right. That's right. We're we're sad too. He's not allowed here. <laughs> His mustache would get in a fight with someone else's mustache. <laughs> Then we'd have to bail him out again. The thing about having a, a performative mustache, like many <laughs> men do in L.A., is that when you come to the Midwest and the center of the nation, you often get into gunfights that you aren't prepared for. <laughs> you bring That's your true. mustache to a gunfight. It doesn't end well. Stephen has this... Stephen has a... Um, I'm going to talk some shit. No, I'm not. He has like Stephen, a, mark this about yourself. Take this out. He's like a chia pet. He just like, he'll have this perfect quaffed everything and then you see in like two months everything kind of expands. Yeah. And then he goes and buys another Chia Pet and he's just like, it's not that. Like, he, it's just like you can see how he's doing by his hair growth. I hope he's selling that hair to <laughs> yeah. wig makers and cancer centers all across the nation. 
You could make so much money. Truly. I was trying to think. There's a couple of corrections corners I have. And it's fun to do them live. Like if something, right? Something just gets posted, then you just do it live. Sure. Oh, the word I was trying to think of was Victorian. That means anything <laughs> to anyone from the other day. Ugh, I was kept talking about a rough, and then I, I dove into the Renaissance, something I know almost nothing about, and got real scared and froze. And then whoever, some friend of ours walked up and goes, Victorian? And I was like, yes. <laughs> yes. Still know next to nothing about it. <laughs> I couldn't have helped you, even if you had gotten it right. Yeah. It's, uh, there's a lot of areas we should not go into. Truly. As and yet, you know. <laughs> and yet here we go. Yet here we are. It's sit down time? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. All right. Someone stole these from the bar at the Residence Inn. <laughs> hey, are you in town on business? Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like I'm at a, a cafe in the 90s. <laughs> oh. Let's see, I'll have um, a Cosmo with a Goldschlager back. <laughs> Put your napkin on your lap. Oh, thank you. <laughs> could we, excuse me, can we get service? We haven't even seen anybody. Can we get service? <clears throat> With America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh, you'll get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality. From step-by-step -step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout. HelloFresh has you covered. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian, and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and, and Kraft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you'll know you're getting something incredible. HelloFresh is flexible, and it fits your lifestyle, easily change your delivery days, food preferences and skip a week whenever you need. Break out of your dinnerette and make deliciousness part of every week with HelloFresh. I love that even though HelloFresh is super easy and they make it really basic and like straightforward, you still feel like you're cooking this like incredible home cooked dinner and that makes me feel good about myself. And that instead of just ordering takeout, I'm actually making something and preparing something at home and that just, it feels good. So for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Murder80 and enter Murder80. It's like receiving eight meals for free only at HelloFresh.com slash Murder80, promo code Murder80. Go by. Trying so hard to eat healthy. Uh, <laughs> don't yell chicken nuggets, please. Oh, so don't yell. <laughs> um, Who goes first tonight? It's me. Okay. Someone recently, can and I see what. Can you see what that's? Show me. Is that mine? Do or you yours? recognize it? Nope, no, okay. I know what yours is. Okay. Shit. Well, you're good. I know, I know. It's only a 30 second jump in time. <laughs> oh, but first, we have to say to all the people who were brought here against oh, yeah. their will by people who listen. Yes, you're everywhere. So many of you wasting tickets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Sometimes when people hear that this is a true crime comedy podcast uh, and they haven't heard it and they don't know us, they get offended because they believe that comedy and true crime, which is basically comedy and murder, uh, don't belong together and they think that's wrong and bad. And um, so we just like to start the show by explaining that George and I have loved uh, true crime. We've been fascinated by it ever since we were really young. But we also, since we were really, really young, have processed anxiety, fear, and pain through humor. And mm. so those things... Right? <laughs> Those things go together for us, and conversationally, it makes sense for us to talk about the worst things and then re <laughs> relieve ourselves, I was going to say. <laughs> Anywhere we please. Verbally relieve ourselves. Yeah. Right in the corner. That's right. In front of each other. <laughs> and blah, 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 you've heard this a million times. Essentially, if you're offended, get the fuck out, is what we're saying. <laughs> They know. They know. Tonight I'm going to do uh, the high hat club murder. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I got this information from TulsaWorld.com. Oh my God, you guys love the internet. Yeah. The internet is huge, first of all. Oh my God. Because it actually contains a Tulsa world. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh my God. How, how expansive must it be? Truly. Can you imagine doing this? Never mind. That say was it. Real dumb. You gotta say it now. <laughs> Without the internet. But then there wouldn't be a podcast. <laughs> Knocking on doors. Would you listen to this cassette of me and my friend talking? It's a ton of inside jokes. <laughs> oh, your boyfriend won't like it. He won't like it. <laughs> You're going to have to go into a different room. Thank you. Great. I'll be back in two months to hear if you like it or not. Get ready with a thumbs up or a thumbs down. <laughs> yeah. We might... Maybe we should start doing it that way. Mixed tapes? More, yeah, like... Or door knocking. Door knocking, grassroots... You know, yeah. home to home. I think that's what we're doing. Here. <laughs> oh, here. yeah. <laughs> we'll put more flyers in record stores. <laughs> yeah, we should. Cafes. <laughs> okay. Um, Tulsa World is where I went to get some of this information. Great. Yes. You remember. Absolutely. Also, there's a website called um, malefactorsregister.com which, yeah, has a, has a lot of uh, great information. And then there's an author named Jason Lucky Morrow who does an amazing website called historicalcrimedetective.com. And he wrote a book about this case called Deadly Hero, the high society murder that created hysteria in the heartland. Are you ready? Ooh, are they mad? No. What'd you say? Are they mad? No. <laughs> <laughs> we don't call it the heartland anymore. It's gonna be one of those. Okay. She threw her napkin down and walked <laughs> She's off. She's livid. Waiter, we need to check. <laughs> you got to snap. You got to snap at him. <laughs> That's, That's right. the only way. Snap and grab at their apron as they walk by. <laughs> they love it. They love it. Okay. We begin November 1934. Yeah. I like the old ones. The old ones for live shows are awesome because... All the references are there of your local shit, but then it's not super recent. You don't have to be like tense or super bummed, yeah. and then we can make all the hideous jokes we want to. That's my, <laughs> that's what I'm bringing to the table. That's what I enjoy. Okay, so uh, 1934, 21 year old uh, John Goral Jr. has just returned home um, to Tulsa, spending Thanksgiving with his father, John Goral Sr. That's right, oh. you got him. <laughs> I get so scared when you point at me that I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I understand. I just, right as I was going to do that, someone screamed something like a chicken, and now I, <laughs> I want to know what it is, but I don't want to encourage they said, it. They said senior, Did they, like a chicken. But they said like, yeah, yeah. Because they also have tension when, when someone's pointed at, just not yeah. at, when it's not, when it's pointed at someone else. They want to be a hero. Yeah. And I appreciate hey, it. Hey, we all do. Listen. Hey, we all do. Okay, so John and John eating Thanksgiving dinner together. Okay. Um, John Sr. is a wealthy and prominent doctor. Junior's been living in Kansas City where he's been attending dental school to become a, a dentist. dentist. That's right. Yes. 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 Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank there you. he is. Oh, hey. that's... Hey. <laughs> what? No. That's not allowed. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mean shame them. Don't fucking, this isn't a hot or not test, for fuck's sake. What are you... Sorry, aren't we not about that? Guys, tighten it up. <laughs> I think he's cute. <laughs> seriously my worst fucking fear. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Let's see what this next picture. Oh, whoa, 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 hey, yo. Oh, okay, but okay, but in their defense, would you want that guy to be your dentist? Yes or no? <laughs> yes. You know why? Why? Because he has one big tooth, and that 
shows priorities. That's what he's about. Yeah. Now I'm offended. <laughs> uh, I have to say, though, there are other pictures of him. Yeah. <laughs> Jay picked this. There were, after I picked it, like, it approved everything, because he's like, here's this picture, here's this yeah. picture. I picked it, and then I looked for a different picture, and that, another one of him came up, and it was a real before or after. <laughs> like, it was like a Maury Povich episode of, like, I, I, I used to be it fugly, looks, but now I'm fly or whatever. It looks like whoever got cast in the made-for-TV movie is of actually himself. Yeah, but he's he, hot. Yeah. Got it. It, I, it might just be that the sun was at a certain point sure. in the sky. You know how it was back then. The yeah. sun was always in different places. With all these sun, you were like a human sundial yeah. sometimes. God. All right. <laughs> all right. Let's. Yeah. <laughs> That's him. Great. Can you tell me if my brush? Like I, I'm not used to this. Yeah. Just like let me yeah, know. Yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Flopping all over the place. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, hey slut, pull your dress up. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. I'm sorry no, you went through that. I won't. I won't do that. To no, you. no, no. I mean, it sucks that you've experienced. No one's ever called me a slut in my life. God, that's the dream. I'm that's sorry. what we're trying to get to. I know. Yeah. I'll get there. I'm gonna get there one day. Yeah, you will. Don't worry. Thank you. It's gonna be hard without liquor, but I think I can do it. I think I can. Hey, man, we're on tour. Like, let's hey, go wild. Fucking. Residence in. It's up. Pull the dress half off the shoulder. Karen, put your clothes on. Karen, stop it. <laughs> Karen, it's 7:30. <laughs> okay. Where's my when spot? We're back in. And the Johns are eating dinner. Okay. Beautifully with with beautiful souls and spirits. Okay. And then afterwards, John Jr. Uh, goes out to meet up with a friend named Charles Bard. Bard is a student at the Oklahoma Agricultural and Mechanical College. Oh, sure. Yeah. Ooh, someone's mad at them. Yeah. That, you know what it is? That's the rival animal husbandry college yeah. that they're like, no, no, no. Mm -mm. Don't bring that agricultural mechanical bullshit over here. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> then there's an FFA section in the back. We'll kick all your asses. <clears throat> John and Charles pick up some girls. Hey. hey. And they all go out for a drive, which is the only thing to do in 1934. <laughs> you better drive around. Um, so around 10.30, John drops off Bard and the girls, and he tells them he's got, quote, an, ap an important appointment and that he has to get to, and then he drives away. Okay. Right. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a red flag yet. It's not. <laughs> um, if he kicked them all out of the car with, a, with his cowboy boot or yeah, whatever, then that's there'd right. be a red flag. Get out. Yeah. Um, around midnight that night, a man named Wesley Cunningham. Oh, come on. Right? Made up. I, pi <laughs> I picture Wesley Cunningham to look like... Um, like alfalfa from our gang, like, mm -hmm. like his hair is parted down the middle and then greased to the sides. Yeah. And his hands are in his pocket and he's whistling. Yep. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of Jughead from the Archie comics. <laughs> it's a different, that's a different person. Didn't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so Wesley Cunningham, he's walking through an affluent neighborhood near the Philbrook Museum. Look at it. Look Pretty. at this fucking rich people's museum they oh have in Tulsa. Damn, guys. We'll it's play a, there tomorrow night. We'll what's, play there tomorrow night? Yeah. The We're going to be playing on this lawn tomorrow night. <laughs> um, so as I was pulling the picture for that, I did this one. And uh, I looked, I just looked up real quick to see what the what the Philbrook was all about. And they have Andrew Wyeth paintings there, who's my favorite painter. So let's oh. really quick just look. Oh, oh look my at God. my dog. Uh, that's George. That's my dog. That's beautiful. 
Now, I don't know if that's the real name or if I just told Jay that the name of the painting was Dog and Barn. But then there's this one. Oh, my God. Wind from the Sea. Have you ever seen this? Have you seen this shit where someone paints a painting and then paints lace curtains over it? No. How did he do that? Karen, can I tell you how impressed and kind of intimidated I am that you have a favorite painter? Oh. (laughs) Am I flexing on you right now? You are. I'm impressed. It's working. You like art? Eh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I Wait, just don't. I'm going to sell you on this one. Okay. No, I'm in. I'm in. Oh, okay. He's my favorite painter now, too. Okay, no. well. No. <laughs> no, you, no, you have to pick a different one. There's ten. Um, <laughs> the, he's famous for the painting Christina's World. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Which, of course... So I find this one, right? And I'm like, oh, to show Christine's world, because that's what he's famous for. I literally know this from Google's images. It's not like I go to the museum and, oh. or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. I don't, you can, I don't care. I'll be like, look at that painting of a feather. Oh, that one's Andrew Wyeth. And then I've done that enough times, so then I'm like, he's my favorite painter. <laughs> There's no book learning involved. Would I? Sorry, art school graduates. Yes. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> all of Tulsa and the Philbrook <laughs> Foundation. This okay. is a very, um, there, this painting is parodied a lot. Okay. Have you, do you remember? That sucks. There was a long, it was like 10 years ago, there was a sit-in at UC Davis, yeah. and this guy just walked by and straight up fucking pepper sprayed, like, just a sitting, a sitting group of 19-year-olds yeah. just walked by and right in their face. Goodbye. Did it. And then someone is genius enough to fucking do this, which is why I love modern life so much. The internet. They think of everything. Then, of course, not to be partisan, but there's this one, which I fucking love. (laughs) Come on. You have to admit it's funny. That's more (laughs) long Oh, my God. Amazing. There was also one of Lisa Simpson and the house on the hill is pink. But the, whoever drew it, I was like, I don't know about <laughs> the stability of whoever drew this. It was, it was clearly not like official, yeah. official merch. <laughs> okay. Bootleg. Art corner is over. <laughs> Back to the story. Okay, Wesley Cunningham. So he's walking near that museum. Painting. Oh, okay. <laughs> Painting. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Museum. He is Wesley Cunningham is Andrew Wyeth's fake name. So okay. he's walking in the neighborhood, fancy neighborhood, high-end neighborhood. He sees one lone car parked by itself on the, on the corner. Mm-hmm. And then he notices all the surrounding street lights are out. Eee. So he walks over to the car. Don't and, do that. Right? <laughs> walk away from yeah. the car um, to see what's going on. He finds the body of John Goral Jr. slumped over in the front seat with two bullet holes in his temple and a 22 caliber gun laying at his side. Mm. So obviously the police are called and then they begin to investigate the scene and they discover that the 22 belongs to John Goral Jr. Um, but judging by the body's position, there it's not suicide is not possible. Also, hi, he shot himself twice in the head. <laughs> you can't do that. Very good point. <laughs> I feel Very. like I repeated that point really. so many times. Really nice thinking. <laughs> Thank you. I went to art school. <laughs> I went to college. <laughs> he could have shot himself and then like, quick, 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 quick. Mm. Who knows? <laughs> uh, oh, you do. I know. Yeah, that's right. I just told you. Yeah, you told me. <laughs> um, then as they investigate, they realize all the street lights have been shot out. What? Yeah. I don't like that. That is a red flag. That is a red yeah. flag. <laughs> Put the red flag on your lawn of yep. suspicion because some tulips of murder are about to grow up out of it. Am I right? <laughs> okay. Good one. Thank you. <laughs> Missed the suicide thing, but got that one perfectly. <laughs> All right. So, so basically the entire scene is very unnerving and suspicious, much like Andrew Wyeth's Christina's World. All right. So the in- <laughs> investigators have no immediate leads. John Girl Jr. has no known enemies, police record. They don't know who could have killed him, why anyone would want him dead. But then, luckily, Mm-mm. a local airplane pilot named Floyd Huff comes forward. <laughs> hey, Floyd. <laughs> With an interesting story. He's every man. Yeah. 
Literally. Look at that smirk. He, of course, knows he knows something. You know what he knows? What? How to fly. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. That's the, the smug smirk of a man who can fly in yeah. the air. Yeah. Unlike many of us. So Floyd comes forward, and he's like, I think you guys are going to want to hear this story. Um, he was in Kansas City shortly before Thanksgiving, and while he was there, he was approached by a young man who wanted to hire him to fly him to Tulsa. Um, because the weather conditions were bad, uh, Floyd Huff said, no, thank you. Um, but he told the young man he was planning on driving there himself, and he offered him a ride. So the man accepted, and during the ride... Um, the young man told Huff outright that he planned to kill John Goral Jr. You got to keep your mouth shut sometimes, people. Yeah, but you know on a road trip when like a good <laughs> song comes on and you've been on the road for Out like... the window. Yeah, yeah, half an hour. You're just, you're feeling a real kinship yeah. in that car. Yep, shared a bag of Cheetos or whatever. Che 1934 Cheetos, 1934 which was Cheetos. just, just seeds. It was just a... <laughs> Four seeds in someone's, the palm of someone's hand. <laughs> so uh, in, in Huff's own words, he said the man, quote, said that Goral was plotting to extort $20,000 from Homer Wilcox, the millionaire oilman, under the threat of kidnapping Wilcox's daughter, uh, Virginia, or her brother, Homer Jr. And here's Virginia Wilcox. Whoops. Nope. <laughs> Shit. No, but who's That's that? Not <laughs> That's not her either. <laughs> Okay. Spoiler alert. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Okay, so these rich people were going to get kidnapped by the guy who got found dead? Yes. And so this dude was yes. going to kill that this guy. This dude was, was basically um, ratting out the dead guy. Thwarting the kidnapping. And saying, he was going to kidnap these people, and I'm going to go kill him. Okay. Yeah, essentially. We're, he we're there with you. Are we here? Yes. <laughs> okay. Here's a photo of Virginia Wilcox. <laughs> um, so the young man tells Floyd the entire fucking plan. He explains that he first considered renting a plane and shoving Gorilla out of it while they were in the air. That was plan one. Mm. <laughs> That's ambitious. Yeah. And then he was like, you know what? I'm going to go back to the drawing board on this one. <laughs> um hard to convince someone to get onto a plane sure. so that you can then push them off the plane. Absolutely. Um, so then the m young man told Floyd, he said he thought it might be easier just to stab Gorel instead, and at that point, he pulls out a huge hunting knife and a pair of rubber gloves and no. shows them. And the guy just kicks him out of the car? <laughs> and the guy takes him to a plane and then shoves him out of it. <laughs> no. Um, I guess he just does that thing that everybody always does when they're uncomfortable, which is, oh, <laughs> and then continues to drive for another however many hours. So when Flo authorities ask Floyd Huff to identify who this man is, he names 19-year-old oh, oh. Philip Kenimer, who is, as you can very obviously tell, the son of a, uh, a very highly respected Oklahoma federal judge named Franklin E. Kenimer. Sure. Uh, you'd never suspect from that level of smarm that he's a <laughs> federal judge's son, would you? No. no. Never. Okay. Is that a Diane von Furstenberg wraparound blazer that he's wearing? <laughs> I don't oh, get how shit. that jacket buttons. It's a double-breasted suit. I Am could, I making that up? I could never... <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it's way over. That's true. Because people had no, people had waist this size yeah, back then. Yeah, they Everyone. fucking sure did. Men, women, children, animals. I think there's, there's really something to eating seeds as Cheetos. <laughs> that might really be the key. You were on to something. Okay, let's write that one down, Stephen. <laughs> Put it on the list. Put it on the list. That's going to be our new diet plan. No more Cheetos. Seeds. <laughs> And it just all different cut types of bird seed. I'd rather just drink water, honestly, <laughs> than eat seeds. You can. Water's on the diet. Oh, great. Yeah. It's seeds and water and now and laters. <laughs> and then, of course, chicken McNuggets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which I tried to order last night. We did the whole, sorry, we did the whole thing. 
of like getting into the hotel late so there was nothing open and then we found on the app, Vince and I, that McDonald's was open and they'll deliver and we were like, green and like put our order in and shit and then it was like, sorry, it's closed. Like we had picked our sauces. It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> so we, but there is a kind of a, the hunger yeah. builds Tell as you're before. on that app. Yeah. Tell me before. Also because, you know, when you're on the app, that's, a, that's what's bad about those apps, is instead of talking to somebody on the phone and being like, and that's all I'll have. Oh, I, oh sorry, also a green salad. Instead <laughs> of having to do any of that, yeah. you're on an app. So then you're like, two apple pies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What kind of ice cream items do you have? Do yeah. they travel? Do they travel well? Well, they're not made of real ice or cream, so they travel <laughs> they great. Still- <laughs> They stay exactly the way they come out of that machine. They stay that way for four hours. You shouldn't eat it, but do it anyway. But you gotta love it. Okay. (laughs) So the police notified Judge Kenimer of the accusation, and he actually, uh, of course, very begrudgingly, but he turns his son in. Ooh. Yeah. Imagine. No. Um, So on December 1st, 1934, which is only two days after John Grell Jr.'s body was found, So the police question um, Phil Kenimer, the son. He admits that he did the shooting, but he explains that it was in self-defense. So he says that the extortion plot that Floyd Huff described that he was talking about was real, um, but that it was John Grell Jr.'s idea and that he wanted to call it off. Uh, Phil wanted to call it off because he had feelings for Virginia Wilcox. Let's see if she's here now. It's not going to... That's. I was thinking of her as a child, so let's make sure she's not... A child? I thought it was a child the whole time. Oh, because she was going to get kidnapped? Yeah. Is that weird? She's going to get... Is that ageism? Lady-napped. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Not that one. There oh, she is. Oh, shit. <laughs> I've got feelings for her, too. <laughs> Yeah. Look at the bra- <laughs> eyebrows. They're even, okay. Also, she has that look and just like, the 30s. <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> still got, I'm this pretty and I still have to do the dishes. <laughs> by hand. With bleach. <laughs> okay, we have okay. to go back one. All right. So it's all over her, right? He says he basically, that, um, that John Girl had this extortion plot, they were gonna kidnap her, but that because Phil had feelings for her, he wanted to protect her. So, okay, so he had the, he was supposed to mail the letter, but he wouldn't do it because he suddenly realized this could put Virginia in peril. Mm-hmm. And so he went to uh, that night, Thanksgiving night, he went to Garrell to tell them that he um, had not mailed the ransom note, and he begged him, according to Phil, he begged him not to go through with the plot, um, but John Grell Jr. refused, and they start arguing, and that's when uh, Kenimer threatens to go to the police with that ransom note he never sent, mm. and that's when John Grell pulls out that 22, goes to shoot Kenimer, they get into like a scuffle, um, and Phil Kenimer says that in the chaos, he's not sure how it happened, mm. but one of them pulled the trigger, and John Grell Jr. got shot twice in the head. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. how sometimes when you're scuffling and you win, yeah. you double. You huh? win and then you celebrate, yeah. which is wrong. <laughs> okay. Got it. And From, then you shoot all the fucking lights out Yeah, then you're you? like, oh, you saw a motherfucker, yeah, I'm bitch. back. <laughs> so, of course, for minimum two, if not more reasons, the cops are not buying this story. <laughs> um... So they question the people closest to um, Phil Kenneman to uh, Kenimer to get a better sense of his character. They find out that he's known for being an arrogant rich kid. Shocking. Um, he's smart, but he doesn't apply himself at mm. school um, or work. He's known to be an attention seeker who loves being in the spotlight, but only if he's being praised. I don't see the problem with any of these <laughs> things, actually. I'm not retracting my judgment of this person. <laughs> Uh, he rejects any sort of negative criticism about himself. What? That's stupid. <laughs> Waiter, we, we need that check. This is getting, it's bad now. Okay. So uh, they also say that Phil Kenimer had gone out with Vir- Virginia Wilcox. He'd, he had taken her out on her first date. But huh. she almost you- immediately lost interest in him. If, if she ever had it in the first place and... Spoiler, later on in the trial, she goes on, um, on the stand and basically goes, I don't know that guy. <laughs> <gasps> oh, 
Ooh. Yeah. Ouch. You but, try to save someone by shooting someone else, and I, this is the way. And this is how they repay you? Yeah. Great. By shaming you in court? Unfortunately, Phil was in love, and he was angry that she did not share his feelings. So then the cops go to talk to John, uh, the friends of John Gorell, and that's when they discover a little thing that was a secret in Tulsa among the wealthiest young men. Um, they had be started a gang of thrill seekers, that's in quotes, a gang of th thrill seekers mm. called the Hi-Hat Club. Mm. Right. So it's a bunch of, there's lots of oil money that you guys know, but Georgia might not know. There's a lot of oil money um, around these parts. Got and it. I guess uh, up in Tulsa. And there are lots and lots of um, what they may have called back then, then the nouveau riche. Mm. Um, and so it was people who had basically been um, busting their ass, you know, uh, on these oil wells. Um, and then they hit it big and suddenly they're like millionaires mm -hmm. in 1934. Right. Um, and so then their children are the worst. Um, <laughs> right? It's almost always how it happens, yeah. pretty much. That's the equation. Yeah. But it's very new, like the money, the, the parents aren't used to the money, so then the kids, they don't know how to kind of uh, moderate it, I guess, so is what they were talking about. So here's the initiation to get into the hi-hat club. You drink 10 glasses of beer, then you have to drive 60 miles an hour around a corner on a street. Come on! <laughs> That's dangerous and nerdy. It's so... It's so fucking dorky. It's so dorky. It's, and you know those, those cars didn't go 60 miles an hour back then, that, did they? <laughs> can't. They have to like wind up the old <laughs> fucking jalopy. Oh, we we're doing it together. <clears throat> wind it up. Yep. And then you have to let it idle for 45 minutes so the <laughs> engine warms up. Do you know my fucking father, it's 2019 and he still no. tells you you have to wait for the engine to warm no. up in his car. Don't just drive it. I'm like, Dad, uh, whatever thing you're thinking of literally doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> like, this car engine is a computer. Yeah. And you're 100. <laughs> Love you, Dad. I owe it all to you. My dad doesn't mind when you talk shit about your dad on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Marty's fine with it. Yeah, yeah. He's totally fine. <laughs> Oh, also at the end of that initiation, you have to smoke pot and have sex. So, oh, yeah. Which you know was swag back then too. <laughs> the sex, I mean. <laughs> Just weird bits of sex it's that no one wants. Seeds and, seeds and stems of sex. Are you gonna put that on my shoulder? What's <laughs> what? It doesn't go like that. Please don't blow that in my face. <laughs> <laughs> thank sorry. you oh my god sorry I was reading I was reading I was reading I'm sorry because this always happens I'll write a dumb joke underneath the thing but now we're too far away but oh. I'm gonna say it anyway okay say it I say it. they call it an initiation I call it a standard Wednesday night <laughs> thank you Oklahoma thank you balconies the balconies are the ones I love the most <laughs> I didn't mean it. <laughs> okay. God, I'm <laughs> just terrible, terrible comedy. Okay. So once they're in the gang, the hi-hat members are free to then engage in activities like smuggling drugs. <laughs> what kind? Was anything illegal back then? I don't, I don't think it was. I feel like all of it was really encouraged. Yeah, yeah. I think, well, no, this was past the old put some cocaine on it when you had a cut time. I don't time. think so. 34? 34? We got to get a drug dealer in here to answer some of these questions. Vince? No. <laughs> I just fucking threw my husband under the bus. See? See? That's what bad comedy does to oh, us. Oh, shit. <laughs> Waiter? <laughs> Will you get that eight ball ready for us? Vince has it. Vince has it in his pocket. We're going to split the tab. God. I would be literally dead if I still did that. No. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what I love is that the cops had no idea that this was going on. So, 
Um, or they did, and of course they just simply didn't do anything about it because all the, the kids in the high hat club were the richest of the rich and all their parents were super connected. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, were, they probably came around that corner going 60, shit faced on 10 glasses of bad beer. <laughs> killed four families Oy. and then they're like just let him go he's a nice white boy <laughs> so okay so they discover that not only uh not only are both john Grohl jr and phil kenimer members of the hi-hat uh, gang but so is homer wilcox one of the intended victims of the would-be kidnapping and extortion okay um so Basically, when the rest of Tulsa finds out about the hi-hat gang, they fucking lose their shit. Everybody freaks out because, of course, today's standards, those things aren't that big of a deal. But back in yeah. 1934, you know, it was a, it was a conserv conservative town. It was, uh, you know, traditional. And they believed all of this was pure Satan-induced insanity. Yay! Um, <laughs> the best kind. Um, <laughs> So they start to fear for the welfare of their own kids. They're scared that no one, not even the good little rich boys, are safe from the pitfalls of evil influence, which is like super backwards. So <laughs> the police also find that on the night of the killing, a small crew of the hi-hat members had taken Kenimer to like driven him around town. Um, the president of the hi-hat club. There's a president? <laughs> See, they're just fucking nerds. They're yeah. nerds with drugs. Um, 19 year old son of the director of petroleum research Aye. at the local college was his name was Sidney Bourne. Let's see if we will get to him. No, it's that fucking picture again. <laughs> there she, okay, her, we know it's about her. There he is. Okay. He looks I'm the president. <laughs> I can do anything I want. I call president. <laughs> I call president. <laughs> Fine, I'll be sergeant at arms. <laughs> Um, so Sydney had driven uh, Phil Kenimer to the spot where Kenimer killed uh, John Goral Jr. on Thanksgiving night. Um, and then on December 9th, just a week after Phil Kenimer is apprehended, a random driver passes by Sydney Bourne's car, finds him inside dead from a bullet wound. No way. Yes. And in his lap was his father's revolver. Um, and the location of the car was not far from where John Goral Jr.'s body was found. Just some rebel without a cause shit This here. is, yeah, it's nuts. It's connected and it goes all the way to the Um, okay. <laughs> but unlike John Goral Jr., uh, uh, Sidney Bourne's death is ruled a suicide, although the hype and hysteria surrounding the case makes many people believe that it could be another gang-related murder. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe because it was exactly like the first one? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's hysteria. All right. And then to further complicate things, um, the police then arrest Homer Wilcox Jr., Virginia Wilcox's brother. For his own kidnapping? For they figure out and are able to prove he's the one that shot the lights out. Oh. Yeah. Why? Well... <laughs> They say, when they're arrested for it, of course, they, have, they get released with a fine um, because the whole thing's chalked up to, quote, malicious mischief. Oy vey. <laughs> Fucking assholes. <laughs> um, they say that they were just out shooting out lights for fun. You know, those mean old lights. We, shoot, we like to shoot out lights and then see if the glass will go in our eyes. Because <laughs> we're the hi-hat club. We have a song. Ready? <laughs> Ready, Bella? Ready? Oh, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Put that glass right in our eyes. We're the hi-hat club. <laughs> What's happening? This is too long. It's taking too long. This is taking too long. <laughs> they decide that they're shooting out the lights on the street where John Girl Jr. was murdered is just a coincidence, nope. even though the decreased visibility would have helped Ken and Mer carry out the murder in secret. Anyway... <laughs> After he hears about Sidney Bourne's death, Phil Kenmer start, starts to spill it. And he reveals that he was also involved in the extortion scheme. He admits that he was a part of it. He then explains to the cops that he was only involved so he could protect Virginia Wilcox um, because he was in love with her and had been for years. Um, he had taken her out on our first date that I said, and he had apparently, quote, penned odes to her beauty. Oh. So I guess poetry was a big part of that gang. <laughs> 
According to Canamer, John Girl Jr. was uh, in, he was big into petty theft, but then he now wanted to move on to, quote, the big stuff. And so in the fall of 1934, when he's away at dental school, he comes up with this plot to kidnap Virginia and extort her father for money, is what is the story he's okay. telling the cops. The petty theft and dental school are, don't really flow together. I mean, he manages his time so he well, must. though. He he's must. just like, and we're just going to put a little bit more Novocaine on that. Sorry, really quick, I'm going to steal $500 out of your purse. <laughs> Don't panic, it's petty. It's not a big deal. So, in, uh, so he, they write the extortion letter together for the kidnapping plot, and then Goral gives it to Kenimer to mail. Kenimer, of course, changes his mind, as I said. So Kenimer says that he went, he found um, John Goral Thanksgiving night, showed him the note, said, I didn't send it. I've changed my mind. Please don't do this. Please don't do it for the sake of Virginia. Um, and then, of course, the whole story about them fighting and accidentally shooting him twice. So this is the picture that keeps coming up, but this... God damn it! Oh, well, that's... <laughs> okay. That's Sidney Bourne's car, the guy that they say committed suicide who was also in this gang. Okay. Uh, I guess we won't go back to that picture. It's not that important. Um, so... Uh, oh, this, there is a good picture of him outside the courthouse, though. Let's see what we do. Oh, this is him reading about himself in the newspaper. All right, buddy. And he's wearing an, an amazing Eileen Fisher uh, jacket. <laughs> it's ivory and dope. <laughs> Are they letting him get a haircut or something? Looks I don't like it. I don't know it where that like is. It. Anyway. Outside the courthouse, when he goes to court, all these people are there. So this is this uh, little factoid is absolutely my favorite and kind of the reason I picked this. Um, the people of Tulsa are so gripped by this story. Well, first of all, they have to move the trial to Pawnee to accommodate all the spectators. Um, even with the move, the frenzied interest in the case is still so high that attendees literally rip the doors off the courthouse to get in. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How bored do you have to be? I mean, like, this is it. We have to see this. How dare you? Wow. Don't you love that? I just picture one kid hulking out and fucking pulling the doors <laughs> off. You need a ton of corn. That kid. Out of my way. That oh, one. this guy? Yeah, yeah. That little guy. He has, he's like, I have a secret. I can rip doors off of courthouses. <laughs> Don't believe me? <laughs> Maybe I could be in the high hat gang. <laughs> you little shit. Get out of here. It just makes me think of all the times people are like, ask us, you know, like, what do you think this thing is with this new trend in true crime interest? We're like, they're fucking ripping the doors <laughs> off of courthouses. <laughs> In 1934, this is not new. Yeah. Okay. The trial lasts 11 days. The prosecution claims that the self uh, that this concept of self defense played no role in Kenimer's actions. Um, they paint a picture of a highly dangerous killer who intended to kill John Grohl Jr. Um, they say that whole story and situation was just a ruse to win the affections of Aww. Virginia Wilcox and favor her family by positioning himself as a hero. Um, and they, uh, the prosecution asked for him to be sentenced to death in the electric chair. Yay. They were super fucking specific about it. <laughs> and they're like, and we'll pick his last meal. <laughs> Bird seed and water. <laughs> okay. But Kenimer's defense team enters a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. No. And this pisses Phil Kenimer off. He doesn't like that because he sees himself as very intelligent, sane, um, and he's insulted. So despite his protests, they bring in psychiatrists, friends, family, even his own father to testify that he is actually insane. Hmm. And Judge Kenimer testifies that his son had enrolled and enrolled had been enrolled in and quit four different boarding and military schools he was very emotional and at times very unreasonable <laughs> it might be the drugs he testifies <laughs> that he'd gotten filled several jobs that he'd worked for a few weeks and then quit and that his son talked of joining the french foreign legion saying it would be a good way to banish himself to from decent society sounds like half the people in LA that I yeah, know yeah it's it sounds like any 19 year old yeah. it's like I'm gonna fucking join the French Foreign <laughs> Legion good yeah dad go do it 
<laughs> Let them. Okay, so, um, so this is all supported by the testimony of the other high hatters who were out with Phil that night. Um, at the, they were hanging out at the old, uh, the Owl Tavern. No, no, <laughs> no. It must be a total shithole. Um, <laughs> So apparently Phil Kenimer came in at 9 o'clock, around 9.30. He told everyone within earshot that he was looking for John Gorrell Jr. because he wanted to kill him. Okay. And then he pulled out his large hunting knife oh. that he loved to brandish. Okay. Um, and uh, a high hatter named Randall B.B. Morton uh, recalled the exchange he had where he said, quote, I said, Phil, maybe I, better, I had better take that knife. I may want to use it going hunting. And I just reached over and got it and put it in my overcoat pocket. And he said, BB, are you going to send me out to, with these bare hands to kill Goral? And I said, yes, if that's the way you want to go, Phil. And he just walked out oh and left God. the tavern. I love that he's like, his, like a drunk driving friend who's like, taking your keys, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Get home how you can, but you can't yeah. drive. Taking the knife, murder how you can. Yeah. How about I hold on to this for you, yeah. friend? So essentially, when it all gets sussed out, uh, the jury deliberates for eight hours, and then on February 22nd, 1935, they find Philip Kenimer guilty of manslaughter. Mm. And uh, he's sentenced to 25 years in prison. So, hmm. oh, that's him in court. All right. What's up, finger waves? It feels like nothing existed in 1934. No. There's like nothing on the walls no. and it's just men in suits yeah. in a room. Not a single. Did you pull the door off or was it you? <laughs> oh. There's the <laughs> That's the newspaper. Uh-huh. Um <clears throat> so Here's what's interesting. So in the wake of Kenimer's trial, the Hi-Hat Club is disbanded yeah, once and for all, oh. as far as we know. There could be a shit ton of secret Hi-Hats in here right now. <laughs> um, so while in prison, Kenimer files for several appeals. They're all denied. Um, and it isn't until April 23rd, 1943. So he serves eight years in prison for manslaughter. And then Oklahoma Governor Robert S. Kerr grants him parole. Um, when he's released, he immediately um, joins the army, um, becomes a paratrooper, and in World War II, oh wait, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> that's his first night in the army. He didn't like it. <laughs> he said the bed was hard and the pillow wasn't very big. That's him going into the Oklahoma State pen. Okay. Here's him going into the army eight oh. years later. Wow. This guy, on June 6, 1944, no. he parachutes into France on D-Day and uh, remains in battle overseas until he's gunned down by a Nazi on August 15, 1944, and he dies at age 49. Um, what? So before his death, he told a reporter, something just seems to tell me that I won't come back, because they, they interviewed him when he was leaving for the war. Some, something tells me I won't come back. I hope that if I die under the flag of my country, those who have condemned me will hold me differently in their memories. Uh, I will. <laughs> okay. Um, one anonymous hi-hatter, oh, and this is kind of what I said before, but one anonymous hi-hatter explained the youthful ennui this way to the international news service reporter. This whole trouble in Tulsa society is this. Forty years ago, these millionaires did not have a dime. They were workers in the oil fields, and their wives were just ordinary girls, some of them waitresses and the like. Waitress. <laughs> <laughs> Then comes the golden flood of oil and gold. They had millions all of a sudden. They showered money, money, money on their children. Too many expensive autom automobiles, too much time to do nothing. Mm. And that is the rich and privileged story of the High Hatter's murder. Wow. Good job. Thank you. Fucking fascinating. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Here we go, everyone. I'm doing the Oklahoma City Butcher. Ooh. Get ready for some fucked up shit. Okay. <laughs> 
Your favorite kind of shit. Yeah. All right. I got a lot of info. I like my shit straight at like right angle shit. Okay. Okay. We can do it that way if you want. Um, I got a bunch of information from, of course, Wikipedia and Reddit, our best friends. Um, and also uh, 405magazine.com. But uh, there was a great article by, called Lost uh, OKC by MJ Alexander. She's this incredible writer and photographer. Um, so, and there's not like a ton of info about this one because it's a real bummer. Okay. So let's start right after World War II. Great. And your boom. This is, let's start after mine ends. Perfect. Yes, we are. Yeah. Po- the post World War II era saw Oklahoma City become a major hub in the, in the um, national interstate highway system. So, <gasps> congratulations. Highways. It's Wait, a, that's not the 405 that goes all the way to us, is it? That's the magazine. Oh, it's a magazine. Called 405. <laughs> it could have been a magazine about highways. Shut up. <laughs> and they would call it I-45. Remember? <laughs> mm. We call it the oh, 45, that's right, right. 405. Oh, my God. This whole country is so different. So different. And big. <laughs> Yet we're all together. <laughs> And what I, okay, I love about, one of the few things I love about traveling is that you get to learn so much about the city you're in just by writing about some horrific thing that happened. So I was like, I need to add some stuff to this story because it'll make it make more sense in when it happened, which is the late 70s and 80s. So um, the civil rights era dawned after uh, World War II and downtown Oklahoma City became the site of the start of a new civil rights tactics when history teacher Clara Looper, who... Guys, she's here tonight. Are you ready? <laughs> Waiter, bring out Clara Looper. Bring out Clara Looper. Um, she was the. She had been the first. She was a history teacher. She had been the first African American student in the graduate history program at the University of Oklahoma. The fighting. The, the fighting I forty four hundred five. That's right. <laughs> Fighting freeways. The fighting, thank you. Um, sorry, I fucking really threw you off. I don't know. We used to have so much fun with the fightings, and you now all of a sudden anymore. it's become a real point of stress for it's us. Let's not do it anymore. It's, you know what I like better is, and then today's money, let's do that yeah, one instead. that's way better. Okay. We're going with that one. So in 1950s when that happened, and then she led some of her students and her like young children um, from Douglas High School... <laughs> which in today's high school is <laughs> junior high <laughs> in the first very first sit-in in American history Shit. to desegregate yes yes the lunch counter at the downtown cat's drug store on August 19th 1956 fuck yeah that's her fucking kids Two days later, the Katz corporate management desegregated its lunch counters in three states, and the sit-in was adopted throughout the country as a, a peaceful protest tactic. Hell yeah. Amazing. Two days. Pretty cool. So, great job, guys. Good job, you guys. You um, did it. Way to go. All you. As the 1960s continued, however, Oklahoma City, when it was used to be all rich fucking oil people and shit. I remember. You remember that. Yeah. Beautiful buildings, gorgeous city. Oklahoma City began to decline, and of course, a white flight and suburbanization began to empty out the central business district and the surrounding areas. It's a similar story at the time all throughout uh, the U.S. By 1961, the city limits of Oklahoma City had expanded from 80 square miles to 475 square miles. As people were like, I'm going to go out over there. Yeah. Right? And the oil beneath the city had begun to dry up. Property values declined. And the new city leaders then engaged in a disastrous program of urban renewal. Um. It went really bad. (laughs) Sorry, guys. Um, The plan was to save Oklahoma City and turn it into one of the most beautiful cities in the Western Hemisphere. That was their plan. And they're like, ferns, ferns, ferns. (laughs) That's right. Cover the city in ferns. Unfortunately, someone else was like, knock everything down. Oh. And everyone was like, okay, see. Um, (laughs) See. 
Unfortunately, what they ended up doing was essentially a 12-year demolishing rave uh, or party where 40% of the down of downtown was demolished and it was 530 buildings so there were all Whoa. these like beautiful buildings that were like the first the founders of Oklahoma City had built to look like this from Europe and that from there and they were gorgeous and these dudes were like fuck this shit progress everyone you know how they do it um, and they were trying to build this city of tomorrow so this is what it looked like Ooh. back then um, that see that building right there, uh, the tall one. No, the one in front of it. Okay, okay. yes. Then they did this to it. <laughs> oh Jesus! <laughs> yeah, sucks, right? And they're like, "Look, it's your new water park. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your own slide." Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I would have liked to see that building go down, though. I'm sorry. Oh, there were some photos of it, and I guess a lot of the. Um, at a lot of the. D- De- uh, demolitions, people would just stare and cry. Because uh, <laughs> everyone was like, don't do that. And they're like, we're rich white men. We can do whatever we want. Sure. So, where was I? By the 70s, with a population of over uh, 350,000, that's correct, um, <laughs> urban renewal had lost the support of many Oklahoma City residents. They were pissed off that the, um, they demolished the majority of the old theater district and they tore down historic. historic Hysterical, historic structures. <laughs> um, and the program was also blamed for forcing retailers uh, and department stores elsewhere. They were like, we're going to give you a new beautiful building. And then they tore everything down and then didn't have the money to build anything back up. So um, they, they tore down a bunch of stores to make way for a newfangled shopping mall. And then that area stood as a parking lot for 35 years. Oh, but a great parking lot, everybody. <laughs> It wasn't one of the cool ones where you park your car and then they bring it up on a ladder. And it's not even that, you know? It sucks. Pretty standard. Yeah. Oklahoma City's urban renewal program was the most extensive in the state. And by the early 80s, the city had cleared hundreds of structures in the area. Um, they, these were downtown and the 200-acre Oklahoma Health Center and the John F. Kennedy neighborhood, which is around where our story takes place. So, of course, they're like, we're going to build... Not the I-405, the interstate <laughs> through here. So we're taking all of your houses. Get, goodbye. You know, to, of course, the majority of the poor people. Right. So the 1970s to 80s were a period of stagnation for Oklahoma City. And uh, let's see. Hold on. Da, 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 da. With the exception of the Myriad Gardens, there was little done to... In- Love that place. <laughs> little was done to improve the inner city or central business district. And so, between 1976 and 1986, a killer struck at least three times in Oklahoma City using the sparsely populated neighborhoods that had emptied to make way for highway construction. It was like free for all. Ugh. Yeah. So, Sorry, excuse me. Um, are you emptying the garbage? <laughs> oh, I bet someone barfed. Oh, no. They did? Oh, we're getting nods of yes. Uh, oh, honey. I'm so sorry. Not you. I'm sorry for the people sitting around. (laughs) I shouldn't have called it out. I'm sorry. It's just that when someone snaps out a garbage bag three times, I'm like, what did I not put the garbage out, Mom? What happened? Am I in trouble? (laughs) Oh, God. All of you. So sorry. You You know it's now happening at every single show. Like, we get, we get messages the next day where it's like, I had a great time except for a girl barfed on my shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> you guys all get free milk duds in the lobby. <laughs> on the theater. <laughs> free clam chowder for everybody in that. <laughs> Stop it. That's not funny, Karen. That's not funny. I don't like barf, unlike other people, and therefore that offends me. Oh, do you think people barf at, uh, at, at Les Miserables Part 2 or whatever? <laughs> I bet they do. <laughs> Who do you think barf gets more barf, Les Miserables or us? <laughs> I hope it's us. I feel like we're number one. I feel like that, yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, no one will ever be... Don't, nobody feel bad, first of all. I can't tell you the places I've barfed. And <laughs> it was a real passion of mine in the 90s, but... I remember doing it in onto my own lap in my friend's convertible car. Oh, God. And she was just like, you got to be fucking kidding me. Oh. 
it's a convertible. You could have turned your head any direction and it would have been taken care of. At least you were being polite. You know, and my dad, would, we'd be on road trips and we'd get food and he'd say, eat over your clothes. You were kind of following that <laughs> yep. ethos. I was just trying to keep it contained. Yeah, yeah. Well, all I had to do was that. <laughs> it didn't have to be contained at all. So we feel you over here. We, we're feeling it and smelling it a little <laughs> <Yeah>. bit. <laughs> okay. Here we are. And we're back. We're back to the horror of life. To, you've now described one of the creepiest concepts, which is a serial killer who is operating in an abandoned neighborhood. That's right. How have they not made a horror movie out of this? Because that's... I think... I don't they? know. I don't know. You're like, have you never heard of... Oh, have you never heard Renee of... the 13th. <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire. I don't know. I couldn't come up with a yes, good one. Yes, they loved it. Okay. It was perfect. That's... It started there. It's like... It was the... Okay. 1976, April Fool's Day. Oh. Mm. On April 1st, 1976, at around 3 p.m., three oil industry workers are in between shifts and waiting for a friend to show up, uh, and they're bored. And so as you do, they say to themselves, let's go check out that abandoned house. I would. I would, too. Yeah. Because that's fun. But their fun turns terrible, they break into this vacant house. It's Northeast 8th Street. Oh, one of the interesting things, and now this makes sense to me because I was doing all this reading about all this stuff I just talked about, and one of the things is they paid a fair price for the people who got kicked out of their houses, That's but good. they only gave them like a month to get out, so there was tons of furniture and like expensive shit left behind. Oh, so you people love to go I know, through right? that shit. I mean, it sucks. It sucks. It sucks. You know, urbanization is bullshit. But... but. <laughs> Drawers, baby. Um, all I want to do is look through other people's drawers. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I want. I don't want there to be an apocalypse, but if there is, I hope everyone leaves everything behind for me to go through. Yes. So. <laughs> it's a slice of life. That's right. Okay, so they're in this house um, at Northeast 8th by Stiles Park. You guys know it. <laughs> um, it's about... It's pronounced Deleus. Shit. It's about one and a half miles from here, so that's fun. Um, the front door is boarded shut, but the back door is unlocked, so one of the dudes enters through a hole in the side of the house. I guess he didn't know the back door was unlocked. <laughs> I guess he didn't know it was abandoned. Yeah, I didn't proofread that. Um, it's dark inside. Someone trips over something. Mm. And then the room has the smell of something rancid. One of, the bo one of them, they see a popcorn bucket in the corner and one of them knocks it over and inside the popcorn box is a severed head 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 Sorry. so this is a, like a popcorn like a bucket from the movie theater i think so That's jesus what it like. that's gonna ru ruin your movie going experience <laughs> into the future that's right shit um they quickly realize it's at the head of a woman, and so they call the police. The police think it's a joke because it's April Fool's Day. Um. They come out anyways and realize it's fucking, it would be a terrible joke, and it's not a fucking joke. Yeah. Um, they find uh, other parts of the body uh, strewn about the house, including what the dude had tripped over, and realize it's, a, it's a, the body of a female. So her, f um, let's see, da 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 Okay, so... The police aren't able to identify the woman, and they try to compare her teeth to dental records of several missing women, but nothing matches, and she's classified as a Jane Doe. A sculptor works with police to produce a clay reconstruction, but it doesn't um, come up with any leads, so that goes cold. Three years later, on April 19, 1979, okay, a couple kids are playing basketball. Oh. When a dog runs up. No. <laughs> with a severed head in its mouth. <laughs> that one person's clapping like this. <laughs> Ma'am. <laughs> Ma'am, stop it. It's what everyone, it's what everyone, it's why we're here. She's a therapist and she's like, get those children into therapy. Yeah. And one of those children was LeBron James. <laughs> because that's how you are inspired. We have to... We have to overcome things to get to good yeah. places. 
He's never been, he's never stopped playing basketball. He sl- hits, drives him. He sees it at night and Wait. during the day. Jesus. A dog runs up. I if that know. wasn't a horror movie, everyone in the audience would be like, this is corny. I have to get out of here. Yeah. That's stupid. That would never happen. And you could just imagine what it's like. It's, you know, probably the neighborhood, if, if abandoned places. And, oh, you may. Okay. The, the cops come, and they are like, oh, shit. And they canvass the area. They don't find anything else. They come back the next morning to just be like, let's just double check that. And they find more body, body parts in places that they weren't there the day before. Oh, yeah. Um, as if someone had crept in the night before and fucking left them for them to find. They're called back repeatedly through the next two weeks as body parts keep turning up. And they're found in news, wrapped in newspaper and in brown wrapping paper like as if it's a butcher. Ugh. Hence the Oklahoma City butcher. Uh, and they realize it's the body of a woman and the body parts keep turning up until May 1st, 1979 when uh, the rest of the, the body is found in the area. A week later, fingerprints positively identify the woman as 22-year-old Arlie Bell Killian. Family members tell police that they'd seen Arlie just hours before she had been found. Even though she is involved in sex work, police immediately suspect uh, that it's not someone on the street. It's uh, one of her male relatives who uh, there were newspaper accounts that, that he had escaped from a mental hospital the same day of Arlie's murder. And he had a history of violent behavior, including attacking things with a hatchet, including his grandmother. She, he didn't kill her. Sorry. <laughs> Isn't this just Friday the 13th? <laughs> oh, shit, is it? Or no. is that Halloween? Is, it might be Halloween. Halloween. Kind of, they're kind of all the same. All right. <laughs> One would argue. That's horrifying. Yeah. Um, police records, they look into him because they're like, this has got to be the dude, right? But it turns out that he had been re- re-arrested um, and brought back to the hospital before the la- a week before the last of the remains were found. So he couldn't have dumped the pieces himself. And so they were like, not him. Goodbye. Seven years go by. Wow. And on March 6, 1986, a mile from where the last body was found, so it's all in this like really small little area, seven years later, um, a leg and a torso from a female are found in an alley behind a house, and a week later, a homeless person finds the head of the next vic- victim uh, behind a house just down the street from there. The victim is identified by the two tattoos on her shoulder as 22-year-old Tina Sanders, and she had been seen the uh, the, at last seen the day before she uh, died. A month later, police publicly link these two deaths and the Jane Doe from 1976. So they're like, everyone, you should freak out. Something's going on here. <laughs> it's big. It's big and horrible. Yeah. The Jane Doe and Killian have uh, distinctive incisions uh, in their face that the killer had done, so they're similar. And the body parts of both these other, these latest two victims had intentionally been scattered in different parts. Um, and they're all, two are known to be sex workers, and they're all young Native American women with a similar like physical appearance. Um, each death happened in the spring, and there was evidence that the killer took his time with each of the victims. And uh, early reports say that the killer's a medical student or physician because they're like, the cuts were perfect. And then the de- detective Eastridge, who's became a cold case detective of this, is like, no, they're not. They're crude and sloppy. Mm. So it's not that. Um, that was just like a theory that came out, yeah, basically? Yeah, you know how that shit goes. Yeah, yeah. Rumor mill. Uh, it's suspected that the killer, named, now named the Oklahoma City Butcher, might have been in the military or even in jail during those periods between when he killed people. But uh, the linked murders don't receive a lot of media attention because of the marginalized victims and all the cases, it, it runs cold. Um, let's see. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so enter uh, Andra Medina in 1993. She comes forward and uh, to report her cousin missing. She had been missing for the past 17 years. Her cousin, Kathy Lynn Shackleford, had been 18 years old and a member of the Sac and Fox tribe, 
And uh, Andra's mother had always told her that it wasn't her business to inquire about her cousin's disappearance. She would leave it to the mom and dad and the family. But as soon as Andra's mom died, she's like, fuck this shit. And like goes to the police <laughs> nice. and is like, I'm going to find my cousin. Um, and so she, in 1993, she calls the police to report her cousin missing. And uh, they, they, Sar Sergeant uh, Norma Adams from Oklahoma City remembers a photo she had seen hanging by uh, in the police station and it matched Andra's description of her cousin. So police can't find dental information for the cousin. They soon learn that her dental charts had been destroyed in a fire at her dentist's clinic. But her medical records from um, the Sac and Fox tribe, they are not able to provide a dental match either. So uh, they, they send DNA to Cal State Berkeley to uh, with the sisters, the cousin's sisters. It matches. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the test proved that it's a perfect match, and the woman in the abandoned house is positively identified um, 17 years later as Kathy Lynn Shackleford. Kathy had run away in June of 1975 when she was 17, less than a year before her body was found. That was the first body that we saw in the abandoned house. Right. Um, and she's heard from two months before her death, and uh, Kathy's loved ones do start searching for her right away, but uh, they get, um, they don't know why she didn't contact them, but they, people tell them that they had seen her around the country, so they don't think anything is wrong, they just think she's not um, contacting them. And uh, her family members talk about her as someone who always had a smile on her face, and it was very caring and always initiated hugs. And now that she's identified, her family is able to bury her among her relatives in Sac and Fox tradition in a Native American ceremony in Shawnee. In, in 1988, city council members, okay, so that's, that's that story. Then we're going, okay, I'm a bad, okay. In 1980, <laughs> good, you're doing good. In 1988, back to this urban renewal bullshit, city council members ad admitted that the urban renewal plan had made Oklahoma City, that was supposed to make Oklahoma City a city of tomorrow, had not worked out as they hoped. And a councilman declared, downtown is dead and we helped kill it. Oh. <laughs> That's how you fucking take responsibility, I <laughs> Shit. think. Shit. <laughs> you take it all. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't until the MAPS initiative in 1993, good job guys, um, that the city began to rebuild itself. So many of the Northeast streets and neighborhoods that the Oklahoma City butcher had stocked are long gone and they've been raised and turned into gentrified lofts and upscale eateries. Probably, I saw three breweries today within a <laughs> one block radius, so I'm guessing. Pare, 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 pare. Yeah, not talking shit. I went to one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's all brightly lit, regularly patrolled areas now. Uh, the Oklahoma City Butcher has never been caught. Really? Or identified. Sorry, guys. Well, and now this is where we turn to you. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to walk you all home tonight. <laughs> to your computers where you're going to solve this yes, crime. Yes, please. Um, and the murders of Kathy Shackleford, Arlie Bell Killian, and Tina Sanders remain unsolved to this day. Wow. Detective Kyle Eastridge, who was the, now the cold case uh, detective, he's, he's retired now, he said that it's interesting that the first two murders are almost exactly three years apart, and then the, the last known victim is seven years later, so he wonders if there's a victim in between those two that hasn't been identified as part of this spree yet. Mm -hmm. He also says that despite the two, two of the women being known sex workers, they were just doing what they had to do to get by. And Kathy's cousin, Andra Medina, who helped get her identified, says that her family tries to think she's in a better place now, but sometimes she wonders who this person is and, they, and is he still alive and they just want to know his identity. Yeah. And that is the fucking Kansas City butcher story. <laughs> Oklahoma City. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Shit! <laughs> you're right. You're right at the finish line. You're right there. Shit, Steven! And that was the Oklahoma City Butcher. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I can't believe, well, I can believe I've never heard it, but I have never heard that. 
It's so fucking disturbing. I feel it's like it's so we, disturbing. We always like try to avoid doing stories like that, which yeah. I didn't do tonight, because it's just so horrible and it's marginalized women and it's you and know, unsolved and of unsolved. Course. But yeah. it just seems it's crazy that we haven't heard about that all the fucking time. Yeah. And now that this insane DNA bullshit's going on, maybe he can be found yeah. and taken yeah. taken in. Yeah. Let's hope. Let's hope. Um. Should we do a quick hometown? Do we have time for a hometown? Let we do it real fast. Now we have, um, before you start pointing. Yo, 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 yo. The three. Oh, there, there it is. is. Hey, 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 hey. Woo. Yeah. I'm all hopped up from the eight ball I did backstage. <laughs> <laughs> he does listen to Yay. us. He does listen. He's never even Whoa. had a cigarette before. Holy shit. I know. Shit. Look, look, at the, look at the one there. Yeah. Wow. Oh, my God. He goes up there. Uh, no. Will you guys climb up there? <laughs> I'm going to be right down there under that exit sign. Okay. Uh, so no one who has puked or been puked on, please. Okay. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good rule. We really do... Not yet. Here's the thing, too. When everyone's pointing at someone and that someone is cowering in their chair, they don't, she doesn't want to be. I do want to tell you one rule. One I know. Rule, um, one rule. I'd, I'd stop yelling. Um, <laughs> just so I can tell you this one rule, which is, you know all the rules. We say it every single time. This one seems to be coming up over and over. Oh, and I feel, and I'm starting to feel bad for the people. Yeah. We want it to be local. We want it to be local. It can, it can be in the state or it could be nearby Oklahoma City, but we'd love it to be in Oklahoma City. But I swear to fucking God, if you roll up here with some Kansas City bullshit. Okay. We should start kicking people off <laughs> if they do that, right? Yeah, that's oh my right. God, I hate this so much. <laughs> I hate it, I hate it. Karen, do you want to do? With the sign that says Steven on it, with the wheat woo, yeah, yeah. Go to Vince right there. That way, that way. Oh, they're coming up together. Oh no, it's two. I don't know. <laughs> Ugh. Okay, turn the lights down. Turn this the is lights. so it's, crazy. This is terrifying. It's truly terrifying. So crazy. Are you mad it's two people? Yeah. <laughs> I'll give him a chance. I'll give him a chance. I, I saw her mouth something about my mom. So right. I feel like it's... Okay. Okay. What's your name? Yes. Hi, Kelsey. Hi. What's your name? Hi. It's Dee Dee and Kelsey, everybody. Mother and daughter. Mother and daughter. Come here. Yeah, because we're wheat woo. I have to be on this one. Wheat woo. Got it. And this yes. says... Good. Cap. Doing good so far. Cap. My last day of school ever was today. Where'd you go? What'd you do? I can't um, either. Dental hygiene. Dental hygiene. We can't hear. She's graduated from college. Next she graduated from dental hygiene school today. <laughs> nice. Okay. It's a dental theme. We should stand over here so we can hear. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is hard. Okay. Hi guys. Hello. <laughs> uh, where are you from? We're from Southwest Oklahoma, right outside Lawton. Nice. Take it. And my name is not every DD is crazy. <laughs> okay. You say that. You always say all the DDs are crazy. Don't start defensive. <laughs> it's a bad look. Okay. So this story is um, very hometown for us. We live in Southwest Oklahoma, right outside Lawton. And in 1999, Kelsey's dad and I bought 160 acres to build our home. So we closed on it, started building our house. And people started, it's about 30 minutes from where we had been living, and people started saying, hey, you know about the ma mass murder on your land, right? <laughs> <laughs> I forgive you. I forgive you. I'm not mad there's two people on stage right now. <laughs> I couldn't be happier. Everything mass is murder. great. Okay. Mass murder. Go ahead. So on March the 5th, 5th 1916, <laughs> There was a family that lived on our 160 acres named the O'Kanes that were all murdered. And what happened was on a Monday morning, the farm hand came to go to work, knocked on the door, nobody was roused, 
and went inside. And inside he found everyone dead. Except there was the dad. Except the dad. So he there was were gurgling. <laughs> there was a grandpa, the mom, the dad, and five children. One of them was four months old. Oh. Four month old baby that the mother was holding. And I will tell you that these newspaper articles that we found spared no <laughs> detail. Yeah, wow. they get into it. Very gruesome, very mm -hmm. gruesome. So basically, the mother and baby were dead in the bed. She was clutching the baby. The baby um, throat was slit. No more baby talk. Yeah. No, no. It was horrible. Let Dee Dee tell her story. Let me tell my damn story. It's on my land. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Are you surprised that her button says, I'm a Karen? I am a Karen. <laughs> And you're a Georgia, that's right. So they, the, there were two boys and two girls. The two boys both were murdered in their beds. They had bullet wounds in their heads. The two girls were murdered, but they didn't get bullets. They just got bludgeoned and the like. And the mother and the baby were dead. But the dad, oh, and the grandpa was also dead. But the dad, because they're all O'Kanes and it's senior and junior and, you know. Right. He was dead. I mean, he wasn't quite dead. He was bleeding, he, but he still had a heartbeat. He still had a little bit of breathing. And, of course, they. this is out in the country, you know, and they had to get... Were there phones then? No. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no. Um, Here, I'll look it up on your phone if no, there were phones or not. There was no that. signal. There, there was no signal. Yeah, there was... The Wi-Fi was really bad back yeah. then. <laughs> Kelsey said, Siri! <laughs> So um, basically, they we had heard that initially the, the farmhand had been accused but, and had been cleared through forensics, but we actually couldn't find that in the newspapers. So everybody uh, immediately thought it was the dad. They had all been playing cards with some families the day before, all day Sunday. They were well-respected family, but they just really couldn't decide anything else. But then there was also part of the story was that the grandpa was a real Frankenstein. <laughs> And that is a grumpy monster. <laughs> yeah. And so they actually thought that maybe. <laughs> yeah, moms. How are you doing, Kelsey? <laughs> <laughs> she loves me a she lot. She loves you so much. Five years of this. <laughs> so they, they, there was speculation that the grandpa killed all of them because they were actually wanting to send the grandpa to the home, a home and that the dad came in, found everybody dead, and he committed suicide. But, and then also, they had a big problem with everybody wanted to see the bodies. Y'all talk about that all the time. Yeah. And um, they took all of these bodies to the mortuary, and they had to, like, lock the doors because there was such a crowd of people just wanting to get in and see the bodies. Nice. Wow. And so they were all buried together except for the grandpa, and all of their coffins were white except for the grandpa, right? And, um, and thanks, Kelsey, for coming with me. <laughs> and, <laughs> And You're not done yet. <laughs> I'm nearly done. And anyway, so the, they eventually said the father did it, and that is the story of the O'Kane mass murder on my wait, land. Wait, wait, wait. But and you can still see in our pasture where the home was. <gasps> yes. So but it is on the over. other side of the creek. Don't come over. Do they know? <laughs> Give them the address. <laughs> Do they know? They know for sure that the dad did it? Probably. Maybe. It had okay. Go. So there was like a wash basin with blood and uh -huh. fingerprints on a towel, and his hands were clean. So that's all we have oh, to go off of. Okay. We say yes. So yeah. <laughs> it was the dad. Okay. The dad did it. Yeah. Okay. And the ghosts? There's no ghosts. We don't go over there real often. I don't play with my Ouija board anymore. <laughs> but the yeah, cows like it. I bet they the do. The cows are fine with it. Yeah. So. Oh, my God. Guys, Dee Dee and Kelsey, everybody, Dee Dee they killed it. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Great job, Oklahoma City. Dee Dee and Kelsey really changed my mind about two people coming up at once. I'm, con <laughs> I'm converted. I thought it was going to be a thing where it's like, anyway, we were in a thing. <laughs> I like to snap judge. Fuck. This that is, was yeah. a perfect show, Think I feel. So? Like. Yeah. Okay. For me. 
for my enjoyment it's of it. Steven edits out me saying the wrong city. Oh, I'm sorry. And this part too. That was a perfect <laughs> show. Do you know that we make lots of jokes about it, but it does break our hearts when you fuck things up because we really do want to give you the presentation yeah. that we know you would be able to give <laughs> if you were the one doing it. We understand that the scrutiny is very high because these are things you've poured over and that you know by heart. And that alone like city name. gives us the shits when we do these things. It's yeah. very, uh, it's more pressure than we act like it is. So Please focus on that girl puking and not me. <laughs> I would love that. When you remember tonight, yeah. mistakes that were made tonight. Not me. It was all her. <laughs> no, um, this yeah. is amazing. Um, Our thank first you time so much. Here. Yeah, thank yeah. you guys for welcoming us in the biggest fucking theater. Thank you to all the people who very actively and angrily complained that we hadn't come here, <laughs> that we weren't in the Midwest enough. We, it works. We love it. It works. We love it. Uh, we are so freaking hashtag blessed that you guys support <laughs> us so much. It's crazy. I mean, this whole ride is crazy, and we can't believe that we get to do this, that we have a freaking book coming out that you guys... It's really bananas, and we're so, so appreciative for everything you guys have done for us. Yeah, it's very... Um, I feel like right now we're coming into a time where we can actually start feeling what's happening to us without being so freaked out all the time. Yeah. You'll see when it happens to you. It's so crazy <laughs> when your podcast explodes. But um, the coolest part, I think, is that every time we know, no matter what else is going on, we come out on this stage that we're talking to a bunch of our friends. And that feeling that we get to be up here and doing the thing that we like the best and that you, and that you guys are here for it is, it is so fucking satisfying for us. And it, it really makes it like, this is kind of the cherry on top of the rest of the Sunday is when we get to be out here yeah. with you guys. So thank you so much Thanks, for guys. having us. Yep. And of course, of course, stay saved and do God's missions, always, please. But then also stay sexy. And Bye, Oklahoma City. Thank you. Thank you, Oklahoma Thank City. You.